For those who don't know me, I'm Joel Ben. I work in the development team as a business analyst. Um, so I'm sort of the person in the middle between the business and the developers and then writing some of the specs for the devs. Um, and I also wear the sort of project management hat in um, each of the releases. So I get the excellent role of doing these webinars and people have to sit and uh, <laughs> listen to me dribble on. What I'll mention is that I'll do the slides um, in this view. Um, if I put it in the full PowerPoint presentation for you, it actually switches off each time I flick between the system and PowerPoint. So what I'll be talking about today is what's in the uh, release 13, which we put out last Thursday. Um, so these are the high level things that I'll go through. So the, we've got the ANS Harvester rewrite, so that's a complete rewrite. Um, the new shorter slugs um, for Research Data Australia. Um, the release of some new theme pages, which are really exciting in uh, Research Data Australia. Um, data source settings page rewrite. Um, exporting collections, uh, collection references from Research Data Australia. Um, some changes to the ORCID import, import wizard enhancements and a new uh, RDA feedback form to replace the contact us form. Um, so the first one I'll go through is the Harvester rewrite. Um, so for this release, uh, we have completely rewritten the Harvester um, from the ground up in Python. Um, the existing Harvester had been around for quite some time. Um, it was a bit troublesome for us to add functionality um, and to debug when issues actually happened. Um, so the new harvester that we've written is much simpler um, and it's more robust, meaning we can debug and we can extend it further um, in the future uh, with, with a more simpler modular design. Um, it provides support for additional harvest protocols other than OAI and GET. Um, so there have been data providers that uh, can't necessarily provide us with an OAI endpoint um, and they don't necessarily want to use uh, the HTTP GET method. So we have instances of CCAN, which data.gov.au and data.gov uh, New South Wales, etc. the state uh, versions of data.gov use CCAN. Um, so as part of this release, we did some testing with um, downloading data using the harvester from a CCAN instance. Um, and that basically downloads records in a JSON format, and then we use a crosswalk um, to transfer those into RISC-CS before ingesting them into the registry. So uh, the previous edits of the Harvester did have support for crosswalks, um, but with the rewrite, we've obviously made it simpler. We've added some functionality um, to support uh, different protocols um, of actually getting the data before we do the crosswalks. Um, it's still not a uh, sort of self-serve service. Um, you, if you have um, some different protocols that you'd like to use or different formats that you'd like to transform into RIVCS, um, the best way to, to do that is to get in contact with services at ANS and we'll sort of walk you through a process of how we can get that in place. Um, the next item is improved reporting for data source administrators and also for system admins. Um, so when I'll get into the, the registry, I'll show you that there's some feedback now when harvests are occurring um, and uh, when they finish and things like that for the DSAs. And for system admins, we now have a full dashboard which the sysadmins can look at to um, identify where there's any issues with harvests. Um, so in the past, harvesters harvests have died um, and they'd sit there for a week or so before anyone would actually pick up that there was an issue. Um, so hopefully the new dashboard will assist them in, in finding those quicker. Um, so I've sort of gone over the schema agnostic and that's the transforms and, and the crosswalks and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Um, and the last one is existing scheduled harvest will continue as normal. So the rewrite happened, we did a migration for all these scheduled harvests that were existing in production into the new harvester um, and they should have been running already or are scheduled to run in, in whatever time frame that they've got scheduled. Um, so I'll just flick over into the system. Um, So this is a data.gov instance, as I was talking about before, this is actually a CCAN um, implement, implementation where we're getting the data from. Um, for those that have used the dashboard before, um, it's mostly the same. Um, you'll see in the top left hand side now we actually have a harvester status section um, and that gives you a little bit of information about the status of the harvester, whether it's running, whether it's scheduled, where it's completed, um, or if it's stopped by error. 
um, and it'll give you sort of the next run. So if it's a scheduled harvest, it'll tell you when the next run is going to occur um, and the frequency, etc. Uh, the batch number is really about the batches that we're getting from the CCAN instance. Um, so if you're a CCAN implementer, you'll actually provide us records in different batches um, and we just have the ID there um, so that we can do some debugging. Um, other than that, the, the dashboard's pretty much the same. Um, when you actually run a harvest, um, there's a little bit more information that takes place. Um, please ignore the errors here. Um, they are actually valid errors, um, which gets um, returned from the CCAN instance when it can't provide us a package, um, but it, the, the harvest does continue. So I'll just scroll down and click on import from harvester. Um, so you can see the status has changed the scheduled, uh, the URI that we're um, pointing to to get the data, um, and the last run um, has just been updated. So hopefully the harvest will kick off any second. There may be some already running. Um, the new harvester has been re rewritten in a way that we can handle multiple harvests at a time um, and we've set that at the moment to a maximum of three harvests occurring um, just to see how the, the system responds uh, with that level of, uh, I guess, processing of, of the harvests. Um, so you can see here the harvest has started. Um, you can see a percentage complete um, and a progress bar for the actual harvest. So this is something new, um, which is, is going to be really handy for the larger data sources um, who have, you know, thousands and thousands upon the record. And they're not sure where the harvest process is up to because it can take, you know, up to an hour for some of the bigger data sources. Um, a thing to note on the percentage complete, um, with CCAN, obviously we, when we ask for the data from CCAN, it gives us a list of all the records that it's going to return, and we can obviously do a, a pretty neat percentage off the, the count of those records. If you're an OAI provider, we have to do some guesswork because we can't get a list, uh, a count of the records from OAI. So what we actually do is we have a look at the uh, numbers in the registry of the, for the data source that exist, and then we use that to do the progress bar. So there's a little bit, it's it, it's a it's a guess basically, and sometimes the progress bar will, uh, will actually get up to 100%, and there'll still be some records to uh, import. But it should be close in, in most cases. Um, so that's the the dashboard. I'll jump into the edit settings page um, for this data source. So the other tabs have, have remained the same, but in the harvester settings. Um, You'll, have, you'll see some harvest methods that are new. So we had previously OAI and the get harvester. We now show CSW and CCAN um, harvest methods. Now again, these aren't really a self-serve thing and we're doing some more work um, to make this screen a bit more user, usable or user-friendly. Um, because it's not a self-service thing, we actually want to filter out the options that aren't applicable to data sources. Um, so again, in the provider type, which sort of marries up to the harvest method. So if you're not using OAI or GET and you're using another harvest method that doesn't provide RoofCS, you're going to have a crosswalk or uh, something implemented to um, transform into the RoofCS format that we accept in the registry. So you can see in the provider type drop down, there's a whole heap of other options here. Um, and these are basically stipulating the format that the data is coming to the registry in. Um, so there's some here for geo networks. Um, there's OAI DC, so that's Dublin Core out of an OAI provider. Um, and behind these provider types is actually crosswalks that transform into uh, RoofCS, which we accept in the registry. Um, so again, if, if you do have a harvest method or a provider type that is different to what we support um, natively, just get in contact with services at ANS and um, we can walk you through um, setting up a crosswalk. Now, if you have one in mind already, I can tell you that crosswalks that we support at the moment are in XSLT 1.0, uh, sorry, not 2.0. Um, so if you did want to start looking at developing a crosswalk, that would be the way to go in XSLT 1.0. Um, so for this release, we sort of ran out of time to do the filtering on this screen, um, but in the future release, possibly 13.1 or R14, the screen will actually only show you options that are applicable to your data source. Um, so you'll probably only see OAI and GET um, and provide a type of RoofCS um, available in the drop downs until you've actually, with yourself and, and ANS, have configured a crosswalk um, and a new harvest method if required um, for your data source in the back end. Um, okay.
Now, I did do a little diagram up, um, but I think if I go into too much detail here, it will confuse people. So what I'll just say is that the existing, the previous harvester was its own software application. The new harvester is a uh, is written as a module of the registry. Um, so it is, it's tightly, well, I wouldn't say tightly, but it is coupled with the registry. So if someone picked up a registry software, they could do um, some extensions to uh, either change the harvester to whatever they needed or take it out completely. Um, but it is more coupled than it was previously. Um, you'll see that I've sort of split the two. So we have what we call the harvester process and the importer process. So the harvester goes and gets the data, hands it to the importer, and the importer actually imports it into the registry. And you'll notice that I have crosswalks in both, um, and that's to do with crosswalks that happen before it gets to the importer and crosswalks that happen within the importer. So crosswalks that happen within the harvester side of things are when somebody says that they're going to provide in the data source settings page, they'll say that they're going to provide RIF CS. Um, but their endpoint may actually provide OAIDC and that crosswalk that sits on the, must sit on the harvester side so that the importer is actually handling RIF CS. Um, hopefully that wasn't too confusing, um, but I won't go into any more detail because it will get quite confusing for people. But if you do need more information, you can either email myself or services that ends and, and try and explain it in a little bit more detail. So any questions there, Karen? Uh, there's just one question. Um, Somebody's still got problems logging into ANS as an admin. We could possibly take that offline. Yeah, we will take that offline and I'll uh, chase that up with services. And if you haven't logged a ticket with services, just drop them an email at services at ans.org.au um, and they will, that will actually uh, generate a service ticket for you and we can track it that way. But I'll also follow it up after this uh, webinar. Okay, okay, so the next one I'll briefly go into um, uh, the theme pages. So we have had the functionality in Research Data Australia for a while to um, basically publish theme pages um, which showcase data to obviously to do with the theme. Um, but it, a couple of weeks prior to, or maybe even a month prior to R13, we actually released eight new theme pages, um, which was quite exciting for ANS. Um, there was some communication that went out, um, but I'm not sure how much it was published, so I thought I'd just put it in the R13 webinar just to, to draw everyone's attention to it. Um, so it's a quick image of it, but in Research Data Australia, in the top navigation menu, there is themes. If you haven't seen it before, you click on that and you'll get each of the icons or tiles uh, for the themes that are available. Oh, I'm not in production in this one. Excellent. Let me just jump to production. Oh, and spotlights showing themes, which is very good. There's a problem with production now. Excellent. Every webinar, there's always one thing. <laughs> Apologies all, um, I probably should have tested before I walked in here, but I assume production should be okay. Um, anyway, this is the test environment, but you will see these uh, the little um, tiles, um, and you can click on those and it'll give you some information about the theme, um, and then a list of records that are associated with the theme. Um, if you have records that you believe belong in a theme, or you want to suggest a new theme, again, just uh, hit services at ends that all they AU, um, and we can either instruct you uh, on how you can add your records to a theme, um, or we can look at generating a new theme based on um, some of your content. Um, so apologies for that. If it comes up, I'll, I'll flick over and just show you quickly if that loads. I'm not sure why it's not loading. Okay, the next one I'll go through is the new shorter slugs. Um, so a slug is basically the human readable part of a URL. So this URL I have up on the screen, it'll be sort of the abestatin based chemical biology, et cetera, up until the very end. So the, this is sort of the, the part of the URL that we call a slug. Um, so as part of some search engine optimization, um, we for this release, we've actually shortened the slugs um, for you for our Research Data Australia URLs. Um, hopefully these make them a little bit, little bit more user-friendly, um, but the main benefit really was around search engine optimization for uh, Google and Bing, et cetera. 
Um, so the idea is that the, the large number of words in our slugs, in the existing slugs, um, were causing us some issues in, in getting indexed by some of the larger um, search sites. So for this release, um, what we've done is we've taken the title of the record, we've removed stop words, um, and then we've actually taken the first three words and the last two words, um, which may seem a little bit interesting, um, but we did have a lot of records where the first you know, 10 words were exactly the same and then the last word was a species or a study or something. So we actually had to take the last words uh, to try and make them as unique as possible. They don't have to be unique, um, but they, we tried to get them as unique as possible. Um, so there may be the case where you come across multiple records in, in production where the slug part is exactly the same. Um, and I know there are a couple, but then after the slash, we actually have the registry object ID um, on the end to make it unique. Now, this isn't the, the record key. This is the ID that we assign a record when it gets ingested into the registry um, for our internal handling with Research Data Australia and the registry. Um, so existing URLs. So if you have the old URL style or if you use the view question mark key equals style to resolve the records, they will still resolve. We do all the redirects um, from the old URLs to the new slugs. Um, so there shouldn't be any problems there. Um, the other benefit of having the ID on the end is that you can actually resolve to that record without the slug itself. So I'll just copy this into the browser and show you what I mean. So this is the record with the new slug. So we have five words and then the ID on the end. Um, but if you, for some reason, only knew the ID, of the record and you didn't know the slug or somebody has mistyped the characters within the slug but we have the ID correct on the end, we can actually resolve to that record just with the ID um, and that will help us as well when there are incorrect URLs that, that we try and resolve in Research Data Australia but the ID on the end is, is correct, we can actually do a lookup for that ID or vice versa, we can look up the slug um, part of the URL and try and resolve to a record instead of giving somebody a 404 or a soft 404 error in Research Data Australia. Um, okay, so I think that was pretty much it for slugs. So I'm just theme pages look like they have. Ah, that's good. Things are going really well. Oh, here, here we go. Pick up in the system. So this is the theme pages in production. They got nice, pretty pictures. Um, we have nine all up. Um, and to get into them, you can just click one of the images, and that will load into the theme. So you get a little bit of information about the theme and what it covers. Um, the themes uh, pages themselves can be configured by administrators in the back end to be slightly different in, in what they dis display. So they'll all have an image, but the, the content might be a little bit different. So for this one, we have some featured data collections, um, some data initiatives, oh, excuse me, um, listed on the page. And they've also populated some related themes, um, data services and the contributing organisations to this theme. Um, so the contributing organisations will be based off the collections that belong in the theme. Um, and you can see there's just a link here um, to every single collection which is in the theme. If I click on it, it will actually take me to a search um, and provide you access to all those collections that are within the theme. Um, and then you can use obviously the facets and everything to filter down and try and find something that you're looking for. Um, so they're going to be really, really handy going forward, I think, and a nice addition to Research Data Australia. Okay. Okay, so this is just a brief one. The data source settings page, um, if you'd had um, some experience with the data source settings page in the past, Every now and then when you logged in and went to the data source settings page, you would get a grey page or a blank grey page, or sometimes you'd actually get an error. Um, these were existing bugs in the existing framework, um, which were a little bit tricky to fix without changing the whole framework. Um, so as part of this release, we have rewritten the whole data source um, settings page. It is uh, much the same. There's really not a lot that has changed besides those harvest settings that I showed you before. Um, the switches that we used to have on and off for different pieces of functionality are now uh, checkboxes. Um, and we've also added an option um, for providing records to the Thomson Reuters Data Citation Index. 
Now this option is not available to data sources, but it's available in the data source settings page. Um, and it's not it's available not available to data source administrators because there has to be sort of an interaction and a, a process that takes place before um, data sources can provide their, their records to the data citation index. So that's sort of a consultation between the data source administrator um, and ANS. Um, and once all that's happened and taken place and we're happy that the records are, are good to go to Thomson Reuters, we can actually tick this box and they'll be exposed for Thomson Reuters to, to harvest from us um, and put into the data source at the data citation index. Um, but other than that, you really shouldn't notice any changes. Um, all the same settings are on each of the three tabs that they were before. Um, so there shouldn't be any dramas there. Um, if you find anything, let us know, but it should be okay. Okay, the next one, um, exporting collection references from Research Data Australia. So we have supported exports from Research Data Australia for quite some time. I think it was 2009 we first implemented uh, COINS, which is content, content objects in spans. Um, and it was a way for us to um, invisibly hide content in a Research Data Australia page that then reference managers would be able to pick up that it existed and export information from Research Data Australia about a collection and so on. The issue with, um, well, there's a couple of issues. The issues with the coins was um, that Zotero and Mendeley, which were the main sort of um, reference managers that we were looking at supporting, they didn't have a concept of a data set. Um, so collections or any other pages in Research Data Australia would actually get exported and still do get exported um, in a less than optimal way, and they don't get to, uh, exported as a data set. Now, we used to, well, we did ex uh, support EndNote as well, um, but somewhere along the line, uh, EndNote dropped their support for coins and moved towards their own sort of functionality on importing and exporting information. Um, now, for this release, uh, we've looked at supporting EndNote um, as their sort of the primary reference manager um, because it supports a reference um, type of data set, which enables us to export collections in quite a nice and richly described format. Um, so what I'll go through is exporting uh, a collection or any, any number of collections from Research Data Australia and they get exported in the Research Information Systems format, which is a format that's not just supported by um, EndNote, uh, Zotero, Mendeley support it, RefWorks also support it, and I think quite a, quite a number of support with the RIS format. The issue, again, with those other reference management tools is they don't have the concept of a data set. None that I've come across yet have the concept of a data set except for EndNote. Um, so primarily we are sort of aiming at support for EndNote, um, but by all means you can export into um, Zotero or Mendeley with the REST um, download. And I'll show you some images in a second of, of what that looks like. Um, the last thing to note is that uh, in the data set type that EndNote support, um, they actually have a number of custom fields that we can use um, to store information that doesn't fit within the uh, fields that EndNote have um, generated for the data set type. So we've actually used one of those fields to store the rights information about a collection. Um, so that's obviously quite an important thing to go along with the collection. Um, and there's a little bit of customization you can do to your EndNote so that the rights label um, appears against your uh, exports from Research Data Australia. And I can just show you where you can do that later. Um, so I might just flick over and just show you the images first. So this is exporting um, coins into Zotero from a, um, a collection in Research Data Australia. And what you'll see is that it's exported as a web page, so it doesn't export as a data set. Um, it does get a title, it has got the authors, which is good, and the abstract. It lacks a lot of other information, which is important for a data set. Um, and it, this is sort of a split screen, I've just pasted them together and on the tag tab, it has picked up the subjects um, that go along with the collection, which is not too bad. Uh, the next image is the RIF export to EndNote. So this is Zotero supporting RIS. Um, and you can see, it's a bit hard to see on that screen, I'll zoom in quickly. Uh, that's gonna zoom in over there. Oh, no. Um, a bit hard to see, but Wrong one. There is a bit more information that is uh, being pulled out from the RIS export. Um, you can see this time it's exported as a document instead of a web page. We again get the authors. Um, we get a translator, ARC, uh, the Australian Research Council, which is actually the funder of the collection. So the export's obviously, again, not ideal. 
um, using RIST as a tiro. Um, but we do get a little bit more information, so we get some notes about the collection. So that's from the description of type notes, and I think um, related information of type notes um, as well. So if there's any stuff in there, it will get captured. And again, the subjects get pulled out. Um, so I think so I'll switch over into the browser again. All I need to do, uh, that's the wrong one, test, 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 um, is just do a search um, for a collection in Research Data Australia or browse and find a collection. So I have a couple here that I was using for tests. So um, please excuse the test data that is in it. Um, what you'll see now in Research Data Australia in the right hand side column, so this is the right hand side column over in the axis, down at the very bottom we actually have an export button um, which allows us to export. So if I just click that, we get two options. Obviously, EndNote has two formats, so they've got a, a desktop application and they also have EndNote Online, um, which is somewhat limited but is also really handy. So we have the two options because they export um, exactly the same information but in a different in a different way um, so I'll use the export to EndNote um, option to start with um, so I've clicked it my EndNote uh, library is already open um, if it's not it'll actually open it if you use Firefox if you're using Chrome etc it'll actually download the file um, and then you have to click on it and it will open EndNote um, for you what you can see is that I have just imported this reference um, you can see at the top here we have uh, the type of data set, which is much better. Uh, we have the investigators, um, which have uh, obviously we can have multiple investigators if they are uh, applicable to um, a collection. We have the year of the collection, uh, the title, uh, distributor, date of collection, etc. We get obviously the correct funding agency, so ARC is now sitting as a funding agency, which is quite important. Um, we get some spatial information, temporal information, uh, the rights, as I said before, this. If um, you haven't configured EndNote to display rights, this will display as custom five. And I'll show you quickly after this where you can actually um, change that preference to display as rights, um, which is, is going to be helpful for some people, I guess. Get the keywords, the abstract, again, notes, um, URL to the record, um, which we didn't really get before in the other exports, um, and the date of access, so the data was actually extracted um, into EndNote. Okay, so why is Australian Research Council? Um, not sure. I'd have to look at the way it's actually listed in Research Data Australia. Um, good question. It may be an EndNote thing, um, or it could be the way we're exporting it. I'll jot that down and have a look at it if this isn't going to load and we'll take that take that offline. Um, yeah, not sure. I'll, I'll have a look at that one offline and keep moving. Um, hopefully it's just the, the EndNote support for it. Um, okay, so where to go for a little bit of help? Um, I'll just jump back to the collection page down again with the button. Um, uh, I should have said that, sorry, just while I was on that page. The export button only shows for collections, um, so we're only supporting the export of data sets at this stage. Um, so that's why it's not displaying on that page, which is an activity. Um, sorry, quick side note. So just next to the export button, there is a question mark to grab help for the export. And if I click on that, there is some online help. A little bit of information about why we're sort of supporting EndNote. Again, it's just to do with the, the reference type support. Uh, step by step of how to export, pretty straightforward. Um, we also have how to configure um, your computer to, to open RIS files. So if you haven't used EndNote before and you've just installed it, your computer probably won't associate the .RIS um, extension on files with EndNote to open directly or to open via a click. Um, so there's just some instructions on how you can do that in both a Windows and a Mac. And then the last set of instructions is how you can actually configure that custom file field uh, to display as rights um, in your EndNote instance, um, which it's really straightforward. Um, and it, it may be something you want to do if you use EndNote desktop a lot. Um, EndNote online, you can't actually configure uh, a lot and you can't configure the, the preferences on these fields. So it'll just display as custom five. Um, but hopefully you will you understand when you look at the information in that field that it is uh, rights information. 
Okay, um, so that's that's pretty much it for exports. I think that's going to be really handy. Um, that we, there has been people asking to be able to export from Research Strata Australia. Um, I know that another piece of functionality we're looking at is being able to export multiple um, records that are listed in a search results because um, there are obviously people doing um, data set reviews and things like that. So we will be looking at that in the future if that is uh, something that's popped into your mind about a request. Okay. Okay, so the ORCID import wizard enhancements. Um, if you've had experience with the ORCID import wizard, uh, the, the first interface that we did was sort of a quick um, sort of get something up um, effort. It, it worked um, and people are using it, um, but there are a few sort of usability issues that we wanted to address um, in the new version. Um, so really the emphasis that we've put on the, the new version is around reviewing uh, the collections that you've got to import into your ORCID um, profile. So there have been cases where people have come to the old import wizard, excuse me, and they have clicked import all without actually reviewing if they were actually associated or had um, some input into the collections. So what we've done is we've removed the import all, um, we've provided check boxes so that people are actually um, checking and, and looking at what they're actually going to import before just saying yep, all good. Um, we've put in a little mini review um, and import workflow. Um, and some guidelines on the page just to, they're not long, they're just a couple of dot points to instruct people on sort of what they should be doing um, and when they should be importing um, collections to their profile. Um, the other little change that we did, they already imported data sets section. Previously, if you imported records into ORCID and then subsequently removed them from your ORCID profile, we never actually updated the list of imported data sets at our end. Um, so for this release, if you remove something from ORCID, we actually remove it from our our end um, as well, so that they're, they're um, synced and consistent. Uh, the last one there, citation metadata added to the search index. Um, so previously, if you're, there were a few collections where somebody's name was listed in the citation information or citation metadata of a collection, but they weren't listed in a party or something like that, but they weren't being returned in the ORCID search. So we've actually indexed citation metadata. So if your name does exist in the citation, we'll pull out those uh, collections um, for you to import. Um, over into ORCID. So if you haven't used the import wizard, I'll, I've just logged into my ORCID profile um, in production. Um, down the bottom here where this works, you can click link works um, and there's a number of options of where you can go and get works to import your, into your ORCID profile. And we're obviously up the top probably because we start with A I'd say. Um, and you can just click that and it'll fire you off into the ORCID import wizard. You obviously have to give authorization um, to allow us to push information to your ORCID profile. So I'll just click authorize um, and it should log us into the import wizard. So the interface is, is pretty similar. Um, I probably should have used test. In the suggested data sets, uh, we will list any collections that we find that are directly related to your ORCID ID in Research Data Australia or are related to a party which has your surname. So there may be some false positives in that list, um, but you know. Hopefully we get most of them right and you don't obviously have to import them all. It's best to review them beforehand. Um, there's also the search that you can put under. Um, so if I wanted to just find something. Very good. Yeah, so just done a search for biology. And again, there are checkboxes. Um, against the records. I, I apologise, I should have done this in tests where I had some suggested data sets. And what happens is you have checkboxes in both the suggested data sets region and also in the search, and you can actually select across. So I can select these two in the search um, for import, and I can also select whatever's in the suggested data sets and then click the import button. Um, so the import button only come, becomes active once you've actually got sele something selected. Um, so I've got these two selected, and it'll tell me I've got two works to import. And these are the guidelines I was talking about, very brief, but will hopefully eliminate some um, some data sets from being imported to people's profiles that aren't uh, relevant. Um, and the section down here is the data sets already imported. So once I import these works from my production profile, that should get updated. Um, so I click the button and I'll get this little mini workflow. It tells me how many I'm about to import. It tells me just to review them uh, to make sure they're appropriate before continuing. 
the little uh, minus icons next to which these allows me to remove items from import um, before I click the import button. Um, once I click import, we'll go off and import them into give me a little congratulations. Um, and it should be imported into my Walker profile. There's a little note here just to uh, review and set the appropriate visibility settings. Um, so not everything that gets published to your Walker profile will be public, um, and you should obviously decide what needs to be private and public in your Walker profile. Um, let me just refresh this page. None of the works, it should have, this has got nothing to do obviously with my profile, but I'll just use it as a test. Um, and you can set the visibility here in your awkward profile and I can also remove it, which I'll do in a second. So if I just refresh this page. Oh, there we go. And do another capsule. You'll see against the one that I've already imported, there's a little imported label. Um, and you'll also see all the imported uh, data sets over here in the right. Now, if I go and delete this from Orchid and say, no, it's not actually do with me, um, that should go. And then if I refresh the page, it should drop off. My data set's already imported as well. Um, so that's main, that's pretty much all the changes we did for the Orchid interface. And hopefully it's a little bit more user friendly um, and will prevent some uh, imports of collections. Um, okay, no questions? Okay. Um, I guess the other thing to note is we do have a video um, for the Orchid, um, how to import works into your Orchid profile as well as a help. Um, the information is is still accurate, well, no, I wouldn't say accurate, but it will still assist you in importing collections into your Orchid profile, but we are looking to update that in the near future um, for the new interface. Um, but really, it's, it's pretty straightforward and you shouldn't have too many issues uh, with importing. Okay. Okay, the new RDA feedback form. Um, so we had some feedback from a number of people and for a long time, we've sort of known that the, the Contact Us page on, on RDA wasn't ideal. Um, so we had some feedback where people couldn't actually find the Contact Us page and had to go through other means to, to find it. Um, so for this release, we have um, updated the Contact Us form to a feedback form. Um, it's available via the left-hand side of Research Data Australia on every single page um, and it's quite prominent so people should uh, pretty much shouldn't have a problem finding it. Um, the new feedback form provides users with some predefined request types uh, on what they can actually ask for or, or suggesting. Um, and it's it's embedded it's embedded in Research Data Australia, but it's actually a JIRA form, so it's linked directly to JIRA. It will create service desk tickets automatically, um, and then we can track your requests and things and, and push them through the, the appropriate workflows. Um, and obviously we're, we're hoping for a bit more user engagement in Research Data Australia from the community now that they can actually contact us a lot easier. So again, I'll just flick over um, my instance test, that's fine. Um, so you can clearly you can see that there is a feedback tab on the left hand side. It, we've put it in the white um, section of the page, pretty much on every page so that it stands out. Um, and no matter where I go, this should be available. Um, to provide feedback. If I click the tab, it opens a form for me to fill out. Um, you'll note that there is a none option at the top, um, and this is something that we will remove eventually, but there was some uh, issues with taking down Jira to actually remove it, so for this release we've just left it in, um, but we've defaulted obviously to request help being the, the option. You just need to fill out a subject and a description um, and provide your name and email. Um, and one of the, the good things about this um, feedback form is that you can actually update, upload a screenshot. So if you've had a, you've come across a bug or you've found something that you'd like to change, you can actually, you know, you can annotate a diagram or, or something and actually upload it to your Jira issue, and that will assist services and whoever's looking at that issue um, to respond quickly and appropriately. Um, so that the issue types for request help report an issue, um, suggest new functionality in Research Data Australia, so we've got some good ideas, by all means, pop them in. Um, su suggest the request data, so if you've looked, yeah, been looking for some data in Research Data Australia and you haven't found it, you can suggest um, some data that we may want to look at getting into Research Data Australia, um, and any general feedback you want to provide um, to ANS. So hopefully that will be really useful for our end users. I think I'm for time, 1.43, okay. Come on. 
Okay, um, so that's pretty much everything. Hopefully most of it was pretty clear. Um, if you need more information, obviously the online services news page uh, has been updated and you can also contact services at ANS au. Um, so I've got the online services news page, I think is open. So news and events on the left hand side of the ANS web page, um, homepage, and then online services news. Um, and then there's some release notes for R13 um, and what was in it, any um, non technical help that we can provide um, for R13. Um, we've also recently updated the online services. Um, homepage and we're in the process of updating uh, the information within the individual sections of, of the online services so hopefully that will help people find what they're looking for um, in a quicker in a quicker fashion um, and for those that haven't come across it there's also the ANS developer toolbox so if anyone's out there that would like to reuse parts of ANS code or even the whole registry we have that available um, and that's just the research data for the ANS.org they use so that the, the RDA um, URL slash developers um, and there's also a link on Research Data Australia um, down the very bottom. Where am I? No, I'll be there eventually. So there is a developers link down the bottom, which will also link you off to the developers toolbox. Um, the last thing is just that you may have noticed that there was a longer downtime or a longer unavailable for publishing in this release. Um, so we went read only mode on the Wednesday close of business five o'clock and had the release on the Thursday morning um, and just to let you know the reason for that was we were doing some upgrades to the, the software on our production box as well um, and we just needed to make sure that there was no records coming in while we were doing some work on the database um, but other than that that's pretty much it for Arthur thanks Thank all you. bye cheers